Welcome. Amen. Well, Bear is flying under the radar back there. It's his birthday. Amen. We got him earlier, so I guess he's all right. <laughs> Amen. Well, it's been a full day. I started out with a men's breakfast this morning. It was wonderful. And, uh, you know, I can't get over how targeted the Lord is on things that are going on and what he wants to communicate to his church. And, you know, we've been very, you know, systematically moving along on a journey. And, you know, last week even uh, talking about the walls of Jericho coming tumbling down and, and how God uses us in such uh, unique ways but very uh, real ways to show his power uh, that it's not us, that it's really him that makes things happen, and it's, and it's to bear that testimony as our very existence here on planet Earth. And, and so when we get that, it's an amazing thing, uh, it, and things just click. But, you know, we really believe that. We really believe that God is very purposeful and that he has, uh, you know, an interest in our lives as individuals. Amen? If you're around here very long, you'll realize we believe that completely and full-heartedly. And the reason we do is because we watch it unfold before us all the time. And so when things happen, we, we understand that we have uh, to be good stewards of what God has entrusted to us. And so as a result of that, um, sometimes, sometimes uh, you see things unfold and you realize that you get to be, you get to literally be like the disciples were when they reached their, their hands into the basket and pulled fish and loaves out and watch God multiply them. You get to be the ones that are an expression of God's love into the lives of other people, and it's just an amazing thing. We serve an awesome God. Amen? Amen. So, uh, interestingly, uh, Brother Al is uh, somebody that does things here in the church, and uh, administrative things behind the scenes, and he's a different kind of character that uh, um, comes from a, a more of a white-collar background, and and we're mostly blue-collar folk here, amen? And so you, you don't always understand things the same way, so on and so forth. But you know what I've come to learn over time is that, that God is uh, the lover of all of us, you know, and, and he, he accomplishes his purpose in and through all of our lives. And one of the things that's amazing that he does, that, and I'm perplexed with it as it unfolds, is, is some things we don't understand. You know, provisions come in, and I'm always looking through our benevolent ministries when something uh, comes into my hands or our hands as a ministry. But when, when I see it, when it's been put into my charge personally as an individual, uh, I understand that there's liability to that. And I say that as in, you know, God wants us to be a good steward of what he has, and he wants you to put it where he has intended it to go, not where you intend it to go. How many of you know that to be true by an amen? All right, yeah. So Brother Al just sent me, shot me a text message, and, and he was, there was a guitar that was sitting over in our pantry, and, it, and how it came in was through somebody that were helping out um, off the streets, and, and it just, in the most unusual way that it came in. And, uh, and it was sitting there, and I just knew that there's going to be a place that that goes. I just knew there was going to be a place that that goes. And, and lo and behold, I get a text message this morning and says, hey, listen, there's a guitar uh, sitting in the pantry room over there, and I sure would love to allow my son to be able to, to play that. Uh, could he borrow it? I, I was like, in, in an instant, the Lord just told me, no, that, that's his. That, that's what it's for. It's his. And so it's one of those things, I'll tell you, to understand the magnitude of that. To understand, you know, that that came into our hands and it's not something for me to make some deal with or do anything with. And it, it's, it, to me, it's a guitar, and it, but to him, it's everything. To him, it's a provision. To him, it's a father giving something to his son. To, to him, it's, it's an expression of God's love into his life. Now, I get that after all these years, you know, of, of walking with Jesus all these years that, you know, I'm a preacher, I'm supposed to say stuff like that, Amen. No, but I believe and I live it. I live it every day. And, and I understand it because God has called us to a place to be that, that church. That's who we are here. We believe that he puts blessings in our hands and they're supposed to go where he intends them. Amen? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. We started out this morning and listening to, to Pastor Randy share his heart. 
And, and I'm always, the text on my shirt is what he, he used this passage. And uh, I'll tell you, I just feel like the Spirit of God speaks through us, and there's a message for us to understand. But you know what the problem is? In the same way last week I was talking about the walls of Jericho falling, I was talking about uh, Rahab the prostitute back in chapter 2 where we've seen that she, she hid the spies and she had favor, remember? All those things, and God was able to show his power through the parting of waters. And those who witnessed that uh, knew that God was with them and they were trembling in their boots. But if we don't believe that, then it's worthless to us. Amen? If you don't believe that God has a plan for your life and he wants to do something in through your life, it's of no effect on your life at all. So to understand it, to live in it, is to embrace it. So you have to receive it. And that's a huge thing. So today we're part of this memorial down in the state park. And, and it's for fallen, it's, for fall and it's, it's our, some of our veterans who uh, they've taken their own lives. And, and it's the Forgotten Warrior uh, Memorial down there. And every time I go down there, I'm always looking at those families. Whew, it's heavy. It's heavy. And I realize what happened, of course, with everybody that's name is represented. Of course, they've got these giant pictures of them on these tripods down there, and, and it's a whole lot to deal with. But I realize every one of them had one thing in common. They were without hope. Every one of them. In the, in the picture of the church is to be the representation of hope. So when I'm there and I'm going to pray for these families, my heart just bleeds to say, I want to communicate that the God of all creation loves you so much. And that the way that we look at things in the here and now is so temporal. We, we think that things end, you know, with the end of the day or the end of our life as you, you turn the lights off and it's over. No. God is an eternal God and he has an eternal place for us and he wants us to have eternal hope that looks beyond today and into eternity. And he sent Jesus to make that a reality. Amen? And so, to embrace that and to be able to communicate that, you first had to receive it. You first had to receive it. And as this, this service begins to unfold, and there's an order that things go, right? And so I go up there. When I first get there, I want to see the order. So I know what cue I'm just going to come in when I'm supposed to come. Two places I'm supposed to come in and pray. But you know the last thing that's on the minds of people that aren't praying people every day is prayer. Amen? It's easy to forget it if you're not part of it, right? You're looking at me saying, oh, I can't believe that. How many of you wed some food in your mouth without asking to tell the Lord thank you for it today before your meal? Amen? You hear what I'm talking about? It's easy to do. I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. But I want to I highlight something as we get into what we're doing here. Is that in this service, where we're honoring these individuals who, who the end of their road came in a tragic way, and we want to give comfort to this family, we watched the, the color guard holding the flags, some of our military standing there, and one of them face planted right on the ground. They must have locked their knees and, and, and the, the heat overtook them and boom, they went down. And I thought, that's why we open in prayer. Amen. We didn't open in prayer because it got skipped. But I, I thought, that's why we do it because we have to rely on a God that's bigger than us to do what we cannot do. Amen? I mean, and that's what it's about. And I believe that full heartedly. Why? Because I've been in them shoes. I've come to the pulpit at times where I didn't feel like I could stand. And I just had to negotiate with God and say, God, I can't do this in my strength. I have to do it in yours. And so I cry out in prayer and I'm looking for, God, I need to be who you've called me to be. And I don't even know what that even means right now. But I'm going to trust you to make it happen. And because of it, the most amazing things happen. The most amazing things happen. So tonight, honestly, I wanted to shed light on something that I, that I really, you know, Pastor Randy touched on something this morning, and it, and it really changed the, the whole scheme of things for this evening. <clears throat> because so often 
we're trying to find a magical uh, routine or, or guidelines to be victorious in our lives. Amen? We want to go through the scriptures as if it's a, a handbook. If I go A, B, C, and D, then I have victory. In reality, God calls us to a place that he really wants to show us the only way that we have victory is to walk with him every single day. He's the light into our path. He's not the beacon that shines way ahead. No, he's right there. He walks the journey with us, and he wants to demonstrate that in and through our lives. And Pastor Randy talked a little bit this morning. He said, people always say God won't give you more than you can, than you can handle, and, and I believe that he's absolutely right. That's a lie out of hell. Because God always allows you to have more than you can handle so he can show up and make it happen. It's in his strength. That's what Paul said, isn't it? Isn't that? He asked for that thorn to be removed from his flesh. Three times he asked for it to be removed and the response he got is, my strength is made perfect in your weakness, right? So God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. Our deficiency gives way to his strength. And so... I was really, really burdened down there in the, in the state park as I just looked onto those people. And I want so desperately for them to receive the love of God in practical ways, to meet him in their darkest hour, to, to find that place. Scripture this, this evening I want to start with, it starts in Matthew chapter 16, verse 1 through 12, where the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him, asking him to show them a sign from heaven. And he replied, When evening comes, you say, It'll be fair weather, and the, sky is and the sky is red. And in the morning, today, it will be, a stor it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given except for the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left and went away. When they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They discussed this amongst themselves and said, is it because we did not bring any bread? Well, that's interesting. Well, that's interesting. You know, the picture of, is this because we didn't bring any bread? And you think about this picture of yeast, and you understand that expands, amen? It expands. And this teaching that you have there of the Pharisees, the the. Uh, problem with a little something getting into your head is that it expands, doesn't it? And it overtakes. And Jesus is always uh, giving them an opportunity to learn something much bigger than it appears. He goes on and says, aware of the discussion, Jesus asks, you have little faith. Why are you talking amongst yourself about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves and the 5,000, and how many basketfuls you gathered, or the seven loaves and the 4,000, and how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it that you don't understand that I was not talking about bread, but, because, but to be on guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Then they understood that it was not, he was not telling them to be guard against yeast of the bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 6b says, Don't you know that a little yeast will leaven the whole batch of dough? Right, I'll tell you what, when you think in terms of us understanding the magnitude of the gospel message, it's Jesus and nothing. It's not Jesus and I do all these things. It's Jesus is the Redeemer who paid the penalty of our sin. And as a result, as a result, it drives us to a place to do things. Amen? Did you get it? That the whole message, the whole concept is that we would understand that 
Jesus is protecting us against thinking that's religious mentality to try to earn your way to something that you cannot earn. Amen? Do you get it? So he's warning them. He's giving them this warning, and he's walking with them, and they're with them, and they're on the journey, following in Matthew chapter 16, 13, and following it says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea and Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by your Father in heaven. And I tell you that you, Peter, you are Peter, and on that rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone he was the Messiah. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised again. Boy, I'm going to tell you something. The burden on my heart really is, do you know him? Do you know this Jesus? I'm going to come down on the floor with you for a little bit. Do you know this Jesus? Do you know the one that spoke to waters and calmed them? You know, the one that, that can conquer the things that are beyond our reach in our lives. Do you know that Jesus? Have you ever had an awakening that you're aware of that he is the Messiah, the Son of the living God? Hello. I'm not saying, do you know of him? Because that's what I saw down in that park. I've seen a lot of people that are born in a country that proclaim a God at some level, right? We have a lot of people that would say, yeah, I believe there's a, a God. No, I'm not talking about that. Not talking about that. I'm talking about, do you know him? Do you know Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of the living God? Do you know the one who paid the penalty not only of our sin, but he did for us what we cannot do for ourselves? Because it's in the deepest, darkest hours that he's the one, he is the one that will give you the victory. The darkest places, right? It's not in the, in the, you know, everyday life, you know, life's a bowl of cherries, right? We got everything. We're in America, man. All the blessings pour out on us, right? I mean, we got credit cards. We can go to the store. We were instant gratification. Like, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when you're in your darkest hour, when you're down at a memorial, and there's people that took their lives. I'm talking about that place. Do you know the Messiah? Do you know Jesus? The one who redeems you. The one that hope can come in the darkest hour. That I understand this doesn't end with this day. This doesn't end because you know why? Because there's a God in heaven that's eternal. And he loved us so much that he sent Christ to die on a cross in order that we can live in a place called heaven for eternity. And the ugliness of today is but a vapor in comparison to eternity. And then when my perspective can change to that eternal God, my outlook on life changes. And I can be a minister of hope. And that's what the Bible says. We are ministers of reconciliation. Meaning that, that for us, we're to be you know, an agent that reconciles a lost world to a holy God. I was talking to my brother uh, Aiden back there and, and just hearing you know, the the. Church of America does not represent a loving God very well. We don't. Because you know what? His love for us, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Are you hearing me? And because of that great love, 
when you receive that, when you embrace it, when you've been at the darkest place in the darkest hour and he's met you there, then what happens in your heart is you well up and you want to pour that out into somebody else's life. Amen? Are you guys with me? Am I talking to the chairs? Amen? Listen, because in my life, you know, I was, I was talking to my wife and it's like, we have this, you know, wow, we, we want to quit ministry almost every day. Not really. But I'm a fat old preacher and my body hurts. Right? I'm just being real, right? I mean, that's real. So, so my mouth speaks, I don't like this, the way this feels, but I would do nothing else. You hear me? So, so it's a confession of my heart. God, you know my heart. I wish I could be on a beach somewhere not doing this. But because of your great love that I've been able to receive, right? Grace and mercy, undeserved favor, and God withholding what I really deserve because of your great mercy. And because you've met me in the darkest place. I want to give that to whoever I can. Because you already paid for it. And so when you understand that it's not something you do begrudgingly, it's something that I look out upon people who are hurting in this world and they're looking for real answers. And they don't want to hear you say, go away and be well fed. I'll pray for you. That's garbage. Reality is, is God has given us the opportunity to be his voice. But we got to do that in a way that's not real popular. You know how we have to do that? We have to put others in front of ourselves. Amen? You guys with me? Okay, I got three or four of you in here. You, you hear what I'm saying? And the, the, the beauty in this thing, oh, God. All right, I'm just going to get real with you, okay? I have a hard time with Brother Al. <laughs> He's one of the people that work with us. I have a hard time with him. He's white collar, I'm blue collar. We're cut from different pieces of cloth. I don't even know if it's from the... We're cut from different pieces of cloth. Amen? But he's a child of God because Jesus paid for his redemption. Amen? Are you here? And so, so listen. So that guitar today, whew, it was just a, such a trip. It had such an impact on me. Because I know, I know that I know that our benevolent ministries, everything that we do, I know that God has given us what we have and it's intended to go into the hands that he chooses. Are you guys with me? You know I live by that, don't you? Amen? I, okay. When I heard this boy wanted to use that guitar, my heart broke instantly. Whew. Forget any of the, the stupidity that we put in the way of of, listen, we're all on the same team. And you know what, Jesus, we're, we're, we're the body of Christ. That's what Jesus provided for us. He's the head and we're the body. And we function as a body when we comprehend that we don't reject any part of the body because maybe we have different perspectives in some way. We embrace the body. I knew that guitar was supposed to go into that boy's hands and Al needed to put it there. You hear what I'm telling you? That's powerful. It's powerful because I, I, I was broken. Because I'm an ornery old guy, I'm just going to tell you. The, the older I get, I'm, I'm cranky everything else. Hey, why don't you act like you got some sense? <laughs> I'm on the floor, remember that. I'm not up there. But that's real. I mean, it's human. It's an expression of the struggles that we have, but at the end of the day, you've got to set that stuff aside and say, you know what, I want to be part of what you want to do, God. I want to be an investor in this young man's life. I want to see him receive what you have for him. And not only that, I want to get past all the stupidity that we put in the way, you know, the things that get it, hinder us from being able to accomplish the very purposes of God. Because you know why? Because I know that Jesus is the Messiah, Son of the living God. And he redeemed me, that's why. I know that Jesus. And my question is, do you know that Jesus? I'm not talking, do you know of him? I'm talking about, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get a shower and, I, and I'm broken to tears over a guitar that I know is going into a boy's hands because God saw it fit that I could have it and be the one to hand it to make that happen. 
Do you know that Jesus? Do you know him that he wants to steer your life in such a real way that it's not about some religious experience? It's not about, it's not about the yeast of the Pharisees. Do you hear what I'm telling you? It's not a bunch of religious, goofy rules that are stacked on top of you that create such a burden that you can't carry them. It's about receiving a forgiveness from a God who paid the penalty of our sin. And as a result, your heart being so alive in Christ that it changes who you are. Are you with me? Amen? Amen. I'll go back up here for a little bit. Drew gets nervous when I'm on the floor. He likes to make comments when I'm up here. <laughs> Amen? The, the truth of it is, honestly, a lot of people say, yeah, I know that, Jesus. I know him. Maybe you hang out with some people that know this Jesus, right? You know, there's a lot of excitement in that, isn't there? It's kind of like being at a championship game, and maybe you've got a sibling that's on the team. A lot of excitement, right? Listen to this scripture. Matthew chapter 7, verse 22 and 23. You probably know the reference right now is where I'm going with it. Is Money will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform miracles. And I'll tell you, they'll tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. Listen, what I'm telling you. There's a place in time that we come to the foot of the cross. The Bible says nobody comes to the Father unless he draws them. So he gives way to an opportunity that we get drawn to him through circumstances of life, whatever it is. And we hear a message of a loving God who wants to impact our world with your life. He wants you to be able to, to live this abundant life that the scriptures speak of, but it's not in monetary things. It's about being who he's called you to be and to watch the creator, the one who spoke into existence all that we know to use your life to change the eternal destiny of somebody else's. Amen? And so, to understand many, many will be the brother or sister of the teammate that won the championship game. And they had all the fanfare, they stood all around all the events, they were part of all the things, but they never knew him. Because they never came to the end of themselves and they never understood this reality that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And that he pays that penalty, but more than being forgiven, more than being forgiven, there's something that wells up in us, that drives us in the darkest hour to a place not to give up. And to understand, because I have something like that, I can press on and help somebody else who might be in a like shoes of where I once was. But the reality of it is to come to terms and, and really analyze who am I and what is this all about. Because this, this morning we spent some time in our morning devotion, and Romans 12, 1 and 2 is one of my favorite passages of Scripture because I had to come to terms with it right out of the gate on my Christian journey. What am I going to do with this Jesus if I received him? And I did, I did full-heartedly, 100% was as lost as a goose, called out to a God and said, if there's any truth to what my little sister was telling me, she was reading me those scriptures, if there's any truth to it, I want it more than the air that I'm breathing. And I received that gift of salvation. And from there, the natural response is Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You'll be able to test and approve what God's will is as good, His pleasing, and His perfect will. This transformation happens. And amazing things happen. In view of God's mercy, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. What does that mean? What does that look like practically speaking? What, what does it look like to... Enter a place that you would say to God, 
I'm going to set my own ideas aside and I'm going to take up your plan. What does it look like for you to put yourself in a place to say, he really has a plan. We are the expression of God, right? And we don't get it. And I think the reason we don't get it is we don't embrace it anymore. We don't embrace the place that we come to the cross. We don't embrace what it is to say, I do know Jesus, the Son of the living God. I do. And as a result of it, somebody had to bring me that message, right? And that's what the Bible says. Faith comes from hearing, hearing the Word of God. That's where it came from. My little sister was with me. She had to come to a hardened criminal and bring a message that I rebuked her every time I seen her. Only one day, one day, God intervened. Amen? Where are you at? I mean, did you get what I'm talking about? In view of God's mercy, have you ever had that mercy of God, right? Undeserved favor is grace, and mercy is Him withholding what we really deserve. In view of God's mercy, to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. In other words, then I'm going to say, God, on the journey, I'm going to lay my life down, the pursuit of the things that I think are important, and I'm going to take your lordship as direction. And when I hear you, Jesus said, my sheep, they know my voice. When I hear you, I'm going to respond. I'm going to respond, and I'm going to be that person that just maybe on this journey, the things that God has called me to is going to change the eternal destiny of somebody else. And when I realize that, when I connect the dots, you understand what it is? When you realize that your life made a difference in the life of another human being, and that what you accomplished was not achievable outside of the directives of the Holy Spirit of God, it's huge. It's life-changing. So I'm down in this park, and I'm looking at these people, and I'm hearing all the things that are being said. They're wonderful things. They're wonderful things. They're wonderful people that have a desire to make a difference in lives. And I'm just thinking, this is so much bigger than us. It's so much bigger than us. It's something that requires the God of all creation to intervene in. So we can make whatever hotline we want to make. We can set up a team of people. We can, we can run in shifts and do all of those things. And we're not going to get it done but God. Do you hear what I'm telling you? The God of all creation. It, it starts with us. It starts with recognizing our deficiency of an ability to do things on our own is ridiculous. God always gives you more than you can handle in order that we let him carry. Jesus said, my, load is, my yoke is easy, my load is light. Yoke together with him, and that's what we're designed to do. But when you try to do it on your own, guess what happens? We start to start to make mechanical plans. And you know what the Church of America does? They create a bunch of programs. They say, you know what? We need this program. We need this program. We need to do this event. We need to do that event. We need to do this and this and this. and ugh, Garbage. At the end of the day, you know what God wants to do? He wants to speak into your lives with another life that's come to the altar of sacrifice with theirs. And he wants to impact your world legitimately as we follow the Lordship of Jesus and he speaks through you. Amen? Where are you at? Where are you at on this journey? Is, is this God of all creation so distant from you you don't know where he's at or what it's all about? That's a legitimate place to start. It's a legitimate place to start. It's to say, God, I, I want to get past the elementary reality that you exist. I want to get past the elementary reality that you sent your son to die on a cross. And I want to get to the lordship position where you direct my life because I allow you to do so when I surrender to you. That's not a place of weakness. It's a place of all strength. Because God in you together are a majority. Amen? Amen? So when you think in terms of, of hopelessness, and I'll bet you everybody sitting in here has come to a place they felt really hopeless at one time. Amen? Yeah? 
I mean, even when you walk with the Lord sometimes, you know what happens? What happens is he tests our faith. I mean, I have to legitimately grab a hold of the truths of the word, right? Like this one, I'll never leave you or forsake you, right? How about that one? How about that one when you, you hear Pastor Randy talk about do not, do not forget in the dark what God told you in the light. Amen? Because that's what faith is, being sure of things hoped for and certain of things unseen. And so when you realize that this spiritual journey that we're on actually has purpose, tonight or today down in that park, I'm standing there and I'm looking at those people and I'm saying, thank you, Jesus, that you give us the opportunity. You give us the opportunity to let light shine in the midst of darkness. And that these relationships that you're building with us, that we're interacting with these people, are going to bear fruit when you give us the opportunity to shine a beacon of light right through the midst of darkness. And somebody that's hurting desperately is going to have a, somebody that they can reach out to. And the truth of God's word is going to have the ability to change what any other philosophy or anything else is powerless to do. These people don't need his counselor. They need Jesus. And so we're supposed to be that salt and light. We're supposed to make this kind of a difference. He wants to do things like last week I was all fired up. I'm in the Old Testament, man. I'm talking about the wall of Jericho. I'm talking about a prostitute that, that found favor in God's eyes and that all these things were going on. It's awesome, right? doesn't do you a lick of good if you don't believe it. If you don't believe that the God of all creation knew you before the foundations of the earth, the Bible says we are his handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which he prepared in advance for us to do. Amen? If you believe that, guess what? You're going to step into it. And when God shows it to you, you're going to just pick up the pieces and get moving. And you're not going to be saying, oh, I can't do this. I don't have the ability to do this. I don't know how to do this. All this kind of nonsense because we understand God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. He's going to meet you in the middle of the mess and say, I'm going to take you from here but you're going to have to trust me. How do I trust him? Well, I'm going to have to get in the word. Do not be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. And so there you have it. you got a preacher's heart just poured out in front of you tonight. I was down in a state park in our own community talking to local law enforcement, and I'm talking to people that we care about that are involved, that are that are former military and that have served our country well. And I realize they've done what they can do. But God has given us a mission, hasn't he? He's given us a mission to shine light into darkness, to give hope where there is no hope, right? As Paul said, if it ended here with everything that happens here on earth, we would be to be pitied most of all. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, we would be to be pitied most of all. You know what else he says? He says, but Jesus did raise from the dead. Amen? And because of that, we have victory already. It's already won. But we have to display it to this world who needs hope. They need hope. They need it real in their lives. They don't need to hear, I'll pray for you. It's wonderful that you pray for them. But they need action. They need you to meet them at the place that God has called you, at whatever place he's called you, listen and do what he says. Amen? Where do you find yourself tonight? You know, every time we have a service, every time I always do this thing we call an invitation, right? Yeah, you can come on up, Tim. Don't be afraid. Yeah, we always do something called an invitation. You know what it is? It's, you could say, you know what, God? You know... I do believe in this Jesus. Maybe, you're, maybe you've been enlightened to the point that you would say, you know, just like Peter, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. How many say amen? Or is God a tree to you? Or, or doorknob? Or, or, or do you understand Jesus is God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us? Do you know that? Have you received it? Do you know him? Do you know him? Right? So now I got one more thing for you. 
because we say we know them, and maybe you do, but maybe we act as if we don't. Maybe we act as if he's an acquaintance, somebody that we once knew. And maybe that's true to some degree. Maybe, maybe you've been on a spiritual journey that you've walked away from him and ignored him. Maybe it's time to come back to walk in harmony with him. Amen? Maybe it's time to say, you know what, God, I want to I wanna really be on the cutting edge of what you want to accomplish. And I know that I'm in a spiritual battle. I know the things that are going on in this world are ugly today. But I already know that when Jesus came out of that tomb on the third day, it was already won. And so now, I want to be active in what you're doing. Wherever you find yourself, if you've never asked the Lord Jesus to rescue you, then tonight's the night to do that. If you've asked him and you've walked away and you're distant somewhere, then, then it's a night that you come forward and you say, you know what, Lord, I want to walk in harmony with you, and I don't care what that looks like. I don't care how ugly it is. I want to be able to hold your hand and know that I'm where I need to be. I don't want to rely on my own understanding anymore. I want to follow you. Wherever you find yourself tonight, as the music plays, would you come? Counselors, would you come forward?
Father God, thank you for this time. I thank you that we can come and assemble and God, that we can lay our hearts open before you. God, as we go from this place, would you help us? God, would you help us to proclaim Jesus as the Messiah, your one and only Son? God, let, it, let him be seen through our lives that we would boldly display what the world would call foolish. God, that perplex their thinking. That they would see your love expressed in a mighty way. Let it be so. In Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.